Everything, we know about William Bass's biography, has been inferred from his literary works, even if encyclopedias do not convey this. There are innumerable indications, that Bass's name must have belonged to the multiple pseudonyms of Christopher Marlowe, that is, of the true Shakespeare. Let us justify this, on the basis of some contextual reflections of Bass's literary works. William Bass's book, Sword, and Buckler, or, Serving Man's Defense, printed in 1602, contains 75 poems of six lines. Be aware, that the title terms, Sword, Buckler, and Serving Man, also appear in a striking number of Shakespeare's plays. Does anyone really believe, that this is purely coincidental? Just read, or listen, to some examples. Let's regard, out of the poems of Bass's, Sword and Buckler. A. An early poem, number two, that yields Bass's definition, and philosophy, of his initial situation as a serving man, and. B. A late poem, number sixty-six, that reveals his real, actual situation, as a serving man. Two. Whether it be by the means of some unlawful deed that might deprive an ancient reputation, whoever to this course himself does give, is called a serving man. And thus doth live. 66. Poor serving man, ordained to lead his days, not as himself, but as another list.
The 75 poems of Sword and Buckler contain in almost every verse an indication that Bass was a pseudonym of Marlowe. The poet explains to the reader why he was a serving man. The motto of the serving man is reminiscent of Henry Peacham's Germanized emblem motto, Ich dien, I serve, serve you, in, Minerva Britannia, in 1612, with a trinity of his quills, that also decorates George Chapman's Homer translation and others. Long stood I mute, and heard myself defamed. In every moody jest, and idle brow. But now my prize is seriously proclaimed. And I become the challenger for all. My stage is peace, my combat is a word. My muse my buckler, and my pen my sword. Nowhere is the historical evidence for Bass, that he had been accused for an illegal act and had lost his reputation. For Marlowe. However these sentences have a definite and significant biographical context. Already in the epistle, to Sword and Buckler, Bass expresses his hope, that he shall no longer be deprived of his well-deserved reputation in the future. In 1602, these poems could have been only addressed to most famous Marlowe but in no way to a yet completely unknown poet, William Bass, with his very first poem. Thus Bass inevitably must have been a pseudonym. In 1602, three pastoral elegies, of Ananda, Anita, and Muradella, by William Bass were published. 109 highly artistic stanzas depict the poet's autobiographical authenticity of an unrequited love of the woman, Muradella, being descended from high aristocracy, with ties to the queen. The poet looks at this relationship from two different time perspectives. One from the point of view, of the juvenile Ananda, and the other, of the adult Anita. Significant clues suggest, that the adored Muradella, was Mary Sidney Herbert, Countess of Pembroke. If one refers to the age of Ananda, 17, and Anita, 31, in the poem, then Marlowe's juvenile love must have referred to the year 1581 and the re-encounter after his life catastrophe to the year 1595-96. This is compatible with the historical dates. The author W.B. of the prose text, The Philosopher's Banquet, carries all the features of Marlowe. In individual sonnets of a high poetic level it makes you wonder, why Bass didn't put his high-level poetry on paper earlier. The book shows a close relationship to Plimenter, to help to discourse, William Bass, and others. It is an almanac of wisdom, sayings, riddles, a kaleidoscope of Shakespearean explanations, beliefs, worlds of thought and language. The fact that Shakespeare, like the author W.B., must be a pseudonym of concealed Marlowe is disclosed in an astonishing way by the author himself. For instance, on page 103 of Bass's The Philosopher's Banquet. The author seems to accord the errors of persons of lesser eminency, as with him, as their author, of a subsequent Shakespeare poem, he identifies himself with. Please observe. A complete sonnet of Luke Rees, with two additional lines of another sonnet of Luke Rees, is taken, without giving credit, to illustrate the author's anger.
1619, four years before the printing of the first folio, William Bass published the first edition of A Help to Discourse, where he outed himself autobiographically in an unmistakable manner. Astonishingly the epistle was written by an unknown T.B., Thomas Brewer, one of the innumerable pseudonyms of the true Shakespeare, if that is, concealed Marlowe. Listen and reflect an excerpt of two pages of the epistle. An understanding man, a man, that knows, what man is then, when like beast he goes upon all four, when he but cries and growls. Making a moral, from his many falls, of infancy and manhood, when from grace man's falls so often, in this spam like race run, from his birth, to dying. One that knows, what man is, when he on two legs go with circumspecting walking, when he has read this world all over, and from thence is led to the end of his creation, then transcends to the power had never beginning, never ends. One, that knows, when he again, begins to leave to be so, when time's loathed twins, age and diseases shake him, when he has lost the spring of youth, wearing a hoary frost upon his head and beard, and in his blood an icy coldness, when, as having stood out many winters, he is like winter, now with a all over, to the ground would bow dot but that his staff supports him. One, that knows, what is on four, on two, on three legs goes, and what becomes these changes, thou hast here at easy rate, that cost the seller dear, both in expense and labour. Poems, in buses, a help to memory and discourse, printed for the first time in 1620, with many reprints, reveal the extraordinary, singular fate, that the poet was destined for. Reflect two impressive poetical metaphors, similes to musical instruments. The tibia and harp. Bass's dialectic farewell to life. When life by breath departs, is life forever fled, is not, as usual, final. He explains it to us. But mine is contrary. That brings no, death. But as it wastes, is new breathed in, and bred. In Bass's A Harp. His first life came to an end. Thy life was death, which enabled him to have a second life. Thy death to me was life for here with nature. Art after death, a life to me did give. Who other than Marlowe, also known as Shakespeare, could have hidden behind such poetic confessions in 1620?
In 1613 an elegy of 21 sonnets appeared on the occasion of the early death of 18-year-old heir to the English throne, Henry Frederick, Prince of Wales, entitled Great Britain's Sunset, Bewailed with a Shower of Tears, by William Bass. The poet, who can only have been Marlowe, also known as Shakespeare, develops parallels between himself and Prince Henry of Wales. He contrasts his personal suffering with the observation of the bemoaned prince. Be aware. Only Bass's elegy will ever be able to explain the completely inexplicable fact that Shakespeare, in his own lifetime, literally contributed nothing to the tragic national event of the early death of the English successor. In Sonnet 5, Bass explains that he represents the suffering of the deceased heir to the throne, using his own suffering. I show the image of your tears, in mine. That mine, by showing your tears may be shown. To be like yours, so faithful, so divine. Such, as more make the public woe their own. Than their woe public. In Sonnet 7, he explains, that he had no idea, how a child, pushed in during sleep, became robbed of his sex, by some prodigious cause. So that he could bury his grave again in the flood of his tears. But why should he be buried twice? But like to a changeling, in his sleeps, become robbed of his sex, by some prodigious cause, his existence thaws to tears, wherein he could again entomb his tomb. But oh, why should I twice entomb him? What folly! In Sonnet 10 he explains, that in his youth, he was blessed more beautiful than anyone else and adorned with virtues. His muse, his voice, his pen would have made his achievements possible. Framed a man, to be as he was born. Beauty his youth beyond all others blessed. Virtues did him beyond his youth adorn, O oh death, how many deaths is of that life compacted? That from all living breathes, his only death extracted. The sonnets 11 and 12 by Bass, in Great Britain's Sunset, condense Marlowe's fate even more. Both sonnets compare allegorically the basic motifs, of Bass's, versus Prince Frederick's, tragic life, using the three metaphors fate, death and time. Sonnet 11. Fates, that so soon beheld his fame enrolled, put to his golden thread their envious shears. Death feared his magnanimity to behold, and, in his sleep, basely revenged his fears. Time, looking on his wisdom, thought him old, and laid his rash scythe to his primest's years. In Sonnet 12, Bass sighs about this triple alliance of fate, time and death. He questions the triad, fate, time, death, individually. O oh death! but you must all lack the dread will of your immortal guide. O oh fate, how much more life did you appall, when you his lively texture did divide? O oh time, when by thy sin this flower did fall, how many thousands didst thou wound beside?
time, lies heavy upon a friend of mine, who has stepped into the law. He is a man setting his fate aside, of comely virtues. A noble and fair spirit, seeing his reputation touched to death. The historically earliest, literary reaction to Shakespeare's death, is considered to be William Bass's Elegy on Shakespeare, most likely written between 1618 and 1623. Bass assigns the poets Chaucer, Spencer and Beaumont, identical to Johnson's laudation in the first folio, a common grave, to make room for Shakespeare, but Shakespeare assigns his own grave. The striking similar contextual tomb assignments, at Bass and Ben Jonson, indicate, that the pseudonymous Bass, alias Marlowe, also known as Shakespeare, was the true, or real author of Bass's elegy. It is stated bluntly, that the poet does not lie in this grave. Bass, not tenant of thy grave. Jonson, Shakespeare thou art a monument, without a tomb, and art alive still. Be assured, Bass could by no means have had this highly hidden and secret knowledge about the Marlowe situation. Bass could only have been the pen name of the true Shakespeare. Alive still. Bass, alias Marlowe, clearly must have assumed, that any visitor of their Stratford tomb, or reader of Shakespeare's first folio, would have recognized the allusion of Johnson's folio text to Bass's elegy. Be aware. It is by no means completely absurd, that the true Shakespeare, concealed Marlowe, invented his own allegorical elegy, which he spread himself in the first folio, behind the name of Johnson, attempting to disclose the message of a faked monument that had to be commissioned, carved, transported and installed prior to the poem's composition, and that the news had to have time, to be disseminated prior to the first folio's typesetting in 1622-23.